Bay Marmots. I've studied Yellow Bay Marmots for about the last 25 years. And uh, this work here has uh, quite a few undergraduate uh, collaborators. The recent work does. Uh, some are former uh, uh, Eau Claire people, and some are uh, and Morgan are still here. Uh, first of all, I just want to tell you about the, the Great Basin, the, the, my study area. It is a uh, this is part of the Basin Range Province of uh, Western North America. So you got the uh, Rocky Mountains to the east, and the Sierra Nevada to the west, and the area in between. You can see the uh, uh, mountain range basin, mountain range basin, so I call the Basin and Range Province. Uh, this is central Nevada here. Nevada's kind of, most of Nevada is the Great Basin. And you see the linear north-south running mountain ranges with desert, uh, arid lowlands in between. And you can, one way to think about the Great Basin uh, is from, is to think of these mountains as islands of montane habitat. So, uh, surrounded by seas of arid lowlands. A metaphor that's not actually that far from uh, being physically true. These are desert playas out here. And even when there's not desert playas, there's arid lowlands. And up on top, up there when you look up, there are habitats and species that you typically associate with the Rocky Mountains. If you've ever flown over the Great Basin, this is what you see. Very, you can see the island-like perspective if you think about the, t the mountaintops, the species up there. And then down there in the lowlands uh, are species you typically associate more associated with arid areas, desert species, kangaroo rats. Contrast that to uh, like the Rocky Mountains, the same thing in Sierra Nevada. You have connected mountain ranges and the valleys are not arid. So very different environments, same species you find in the Rocky Mountains and Sierra Nevada, very different surroundings. Uh, when I'm talking about the, the montane zone, what I mean is I, I'm, it's a general term, and I'm defining it as everything above approximately 7,000 feet all the way to the top of the alpine tundra. And then below that, uh, usually there's a band of pinyon pine and juniper below that are the arid lowlands. That's, that's, that's the way I'm, I'm categorizing it here. Typically, we know the montane species are found up here and not down here. These montane species are species like American pica. Uh, the, the habitats are the kind of habitats the wildflowers, uh, for example, you associate with the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada. Uh, they are uh, also called boreal species. They're derived from the north. Uh, they are mon mountain dwelling, typically mountain dwelling. Uh, they're cold adapted, so six months of the year, these are snow covered environments. They have they either hibernate or like pikas, they have adaptations for storing food and being active underneath the snow. Uh, and they also tend to be intolerant of heat and drought. So they're, they're sensitive to heat, uh, and they you know, are not adapted to long periods without precipitation. Uh, this is some pictures uh, showing the diversity of montane habitats. If you look up there, uh, they're not, they don't always look like the Rocky Mountains, the high mountains, like the ski resorts and places like that. Uh, nonetheless, most of the trees uh, cover is going to be up in the montane areas. Uh, it's not always tree cover. Sometimes it really does look like a, there are some glacial, uh, some glacial carved valleys there. Uh, actually, not that many. Uh, other times, this is more what it looks like right here. You got some aspen groves out there, uh, some sunflower there. Uh, that's the high elevations in one of the mountain ranges in Nevada. And if you ever climb from the uh, climb one of these mountain ranges, we always started from the bottom and went up. You can feel the refugia, the cold air refugia up there. Uh, you go up and up and up and. You finally get to like a little group of aspens here, and uh, Riley, my dog, and we all, our students, we all appreciate these. And you can feel the, the how these music, uh, cool environments could be uh, something that um, you know is protecting. It could protect montane species from the, from heat. Down in there, lowlands. When I refer to air lowlands, the very bo valley, valley bottoms are uh, alluvium-filled valleys uh, that are uh, it's like two miles of alluvium, actually, in some cases. Uh, flat. And then you got the foothills uh, here, uh, sparsely vegetated in some cases, but up here a little higher, you got a lot of sagebrush. Species that you find, mountain species you don't find down there. You can think of these mountain ranges as just fault, uh, faulted up with basically buried, half buried in their own alluvium. And this is, uh, so if you look at, kind of imagine the way uh, these uh, uh, mountain zones are, they occupy the top elevations of these mountain ranges. 
and then there's the desert valleys below. But it wasn't always that way. At late Pleistocene, the end of last ice age, these montane environments, all the species associated with them, were found down into the into the valleys. The bo valley bottoms, many of them had lakes in them, sometimes very large connected lakes, um, and uh, much different environment. They weren't they didn't have the degree of isolation of montane habitats that you do now. By the early Holocene, about uh, 8,500 years ago, you have natural warming as we move into the interglacial that we're in now. You have the retraction and uh, sort of upslope shifting montane uh, habitats, and these lakes start to dry up. And now we have our present day is what we had I just showed you there. You have fairly isolated montane habitat. Now, how about the future? Uh, there's a great concern that modern warming is a sort of a speed up version of the Holocene, natural warming. And if that's the case, then if you just extrapolate the contraction and retraction of montane habitats to 2150, uh, given business as usual type of climate projections, well, you end up with very little montane habitat left, very, very small little islands. In fact, you know, parts of mountain ranges that are low elevation it just gets pushed off the top of the mountain. Uh, you all seen this graph here uh, last year, the warmest uh, year on record. Uh, you know, this is going to keep on. Uh, you definitely have decades more of this kind of heating. So there's a real uh, question about how montane species are going to respond. Um, and, and we can look, we can look at the past to kind of get an idea for what might happen. And uh, one thing we know what happened was that uh, the megafauna of the Great Basin went extinct as we entered the interglacial. Uh, at least indirectly as a result, probably directly as a result of the uh, warming and the change in the vegetation. Brown sloths, uh, camels, there was, there was a cheetah, uh, this, all these species that horses evolved in the Great Basin. Uh, and then they went extinct. Uh, about the time Clovis people uh, took hold out there. Uh, and so we know that, but another thing that happened was a lot of the same species we have now were down in the lower elevations and those populations started going extinct. They disappear from the fossil record at low elevations, like pikas. You had pikas down in those desert valleys. Now you don't. Uh, you have, in fact, the elevation, you, if you went back into the, like the Lake Wisconsin, you would find pikas living down in, about, down in those desert valleys, as long as there were rocks. And now you have to do journey gulf about 8,000 feet to find them. Uh, the, the montane mammals are uh, really sort of, people are focusing on them as kind of a uh, sentinels for climate change. We can watch and see what's happening to them. We might get an idea for what's going to happen in the future. The elevated environments, the old mineral ground squirrels. They are uh, very sensitive to heat. Uh, environments will die in a trap, even in the high Rocky Mountains of Colorado on a summer, mor a summer morning. If left for 30 minutes in direct sunlight, they would die. Same with the ground squirrel. And uh, the problem is the lower elevation boundaries of where they are, are might even become intolerably hot tolerably dry, they may start losing those little populations down there in the lower elevations, like we saw with the other uh, species during the last interglacial. You can kind of think of it as uh, in different ways, like the montane habitats shifting up, or you can think of it as arid environments creeping up the valleys, decade after decade after decade. It's, this is called the escalator effect, this upslope shift of montane life zones. Uh, there's complexities to this. It's not a simple relationship. But this is the idea that you have a shift. The kind of environments you have now, if you know our if generation of our great grandkids would go back to Great Basin, they would have to go higher up the slopes to find that same, those patches of spruce and fir and whatever it is, maybe marmots. So if you imagine a mountain range like that in the Great Basin, the say the average te summer temperature is about 70 around now, you might uh, by 2050 you might have to go up a little higher to find that average in which you get you're getting heating in the whole thing uh, but you can think of the higher elevations as sort of a you know that's a cooler refugia uh, and this is uh, basically illustrated by this idea here that you have vegetation zones shifting up slope over time now the question is what about all the mammals and species that are living in those do they shift up do they adapt uh, there is actually quite a bit of evidence that worldwide that their shift is actually happening in wildlife. Butterflies in Spain have been documented. Lower, po lower elevated populations ex going extinct. Others, you actually have to go higher and higher to find them. Same species. It's been found uh, most more recently uh, in 
study in uh, Yosemite National Park, small mammals like uh, alpine chipmunk, the lower part of its range, they're, they're dying out. And then uh, the low elevation chipmunks, they are uh, very rare now. The idea being that those environments got too hot, too dry for them. Uh, you can think of those high elevations as being sort of a refugia. The problem with that is, you know, so maybe the montane species will just keep retracting into those. The problem with that is, is mountain ranges are tapered to the top. So as you get higher and higher, there's less available higher elevation habitat. So eventually you get contraction of montane zones, and then eventually these habitats are pushed off the top, which has already happened in very low mountain ranges. Presumably, there was you know, this little range here, which is kind of a nothing little range, and it might have had alpine tundra in the places there. And so, what, well, how are species going to respond? Montane species. I mean, the montane mammals already are very isolated. Right? Pikas, here, here's just a typical area down here in the valleys. Pikas are up in the mountains. Uh, are they completely isolated? That's a different question. There's a bit of debate about that. Uh, probably not completely isolated. You know, the reason I'm thinking about isolated is, you know, a little population that goes extinct, if it goes extinct, maybe it can be recolonized. Like a little population of wood frogs around Eau Claire, it might blink off, go extinct one year, but it'd be recolonized the next year by other wood frog populations. Can the same thing happen in the Great Basin? Depends on how connected populations are. My dissertation work with marmots, genetic evidence, suggested they actually do cross these desert valleys, or at least around the edges here, and do are connected. Uh, this was a genetic study. And really, I think what was going on is over the years they do disperse to the island hop. Maybe they don't cross the valleys. Uh, so uh, these marmots, they are uh, a rodent. They're about the size and shape of woodchuck, closely related to woodchucks, closely related to ground squirrels and prairie dogs, squirrel family. Their habitat in the Great Basin uh, is really focused around the burrows. They find natural features of the landscape where there's holes, it could be a cabin, it could be a rock pile, but then they get underneath it and then they dig a hole underneath that. They get way down in the ground and have a burrow where they can hibernate in and also burrow during the summer. It usually includes some, at least one large rock. I like rocky areas. This would be a typical marmot habitat in the Great Basin. I look at that and I would almost bet $100 you're going to find marmot scat in there. Um, during the winter, well, it's pretty simple. Six to eight months of the winter they hibernate and they're just not out. That's just fact. I mean, basically at some point in October, November, they go in and they won't come out until, depending on what elevation they're at, February to even May. Six to eight months of the year, hibernating. Um, marmot habitat, what is marmot habitat? Uh, you would think after all these years of studying, I know what it is, but I don't. I'm still, uh, that's my, sort of my, my area of research. My surveys in the Great Basin show a clear gradient in abundance, though. If you find marmots, say, on a slope like this, you find them, you woke up, you find them, you're going to get more and more common as you go higher and higher. So this rock pile here, the same one here, did not have any marmots on it. But if you look at the same kind of rock formation, same rock type, same feature higher, you find marmots all the way to the top. As long as there's rocks there. That's a very clear pattern. All of those probably also have been to a ski resort or somewhere like uh, you know, Yosemite or and you see how abundant they are up there. That's where the marmots really are most abundant. They're much less common under 7,500 feet elevation. That study in my work shows this consistently. And I always started at the bottom and walked up. So there's that. They seem like a good mountain sea. The problem is, inconveniently, that some populations in the United States are found at low elevation. Craters of the Moon National Monument, uh, Snake River Canyon, Cache Valley, which is the agricultural valley of the Idaho border. Uh, not very montane habitat there at all. There seems to be sort of two stories of marmot habitat. But one is, there are very few studies of marmot habitat. They are not, not many studies. So it's kind of an open area of research is why I'm studying it. Uh, my objectives were to basically get a better understanding of marmot habitat. Um, in the Great Basin, since it's basically unstudied in the Great Basin. And I really want to know the effects of future warming, try to get an idea. I thought maybe, I was thinking for a while, they might be actually a good symptom. They're common. I mean, if you have a park service, BLM can monitor marmot populations over the next 20, 50, 100 years, then you might have, be able to make some predictions and 
can kind of think of them, well, what, if marmots are going extinct, maybe other things are also going extinct. Uh, they're really out interested in the potential for them to adapt. And can they adapt? Uh, so what did I do in my methods? Um, fortunately, at, at Great Basin, it's a very large area, uh, larger than the state of Nevada. Uh, fortunately, a lot of pe some, pe some people have gone out and done a lot of field work out there and have compiled uh, field notes, in some cases publications. Uh, I have a historic period. Um, the data I'm going to show you here is from the period 1929 to 1945, and then a modern period, which is I call it 1999 to present. Compare the historic period to the modern period in terms of where marmots are, are there, where they're absent. I would search field notes, all my records, everything I get my hands on, talk to people, everything I could find. And I also went out with my students from Eau Claire here in uh, summers, uh, June, May and June, 2013-14. Uh, I went out last year briefly. Um, field notes. <coughs> uh, my, I it really depend on uh, ER Hall. He was a, a mammologist at Berkeley and then went with the Kansas, uh, University of Kansas later on. He did statewide surveys in Nevada, published his book, Mammals in Nevada. But when I really need, got the information I really that I scoured with hundreds of pages of his field notes, which are available from NBC Museum in Berkeley. So I went out and uh, read these. It took months of reading and writing down and noting where they're not, they're not archived in a digital way. So I had to physically read, read them to find all the exact locations. Then there was this guy, Chris Bloyd, that's me, uh, who in 1999, 2003, searched 25 mountain ranges as part of other, my dissertation research. And I have my awful field notes that I went back through uh, and got exact details of where I found them, like I could remember, you know, <laughs> things you, some things I remember and other things I have, I literally have no memory of what I wrote. It's zero, like I hate, you know. When not, I ran it out of water. It gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out of water one night and had to get up in the middle of the night and walk uh, miles in the dark to find it. I have no memory of that. How could I forget that? But anyway, I was able to figure out where exactly, you know, Mount Jefferson and so on. So anyway, I have all that. Uh, and I also looked online wherever I could get, and there's some published papers that have a few bit, did, did some modern distributions, but mainly it was the field notes and then our field work. Field work is pretty straightforward. We started at the valley bottom. This is what I did in the uh, early uh, 2000s, and just walked up canyons sometimes, sometimes hillsides, sometimes ridges. Um, and we covered all habitats. We didn't just go to one, but we did especially focus on rocks, we searched rocks for scats, we listened for environments, we talked to local people, uh, just scoured uh, areas. Uh, this is an example of some of the people, my friend Bob Miller, uh, who I stayed at his ranch during my dissertation days, and, He's been a valuable source, of, mainly a source of other people who have information, like this guy here, who uh, got out of prison and uh, worked with Bob for a while, and he eats marmots, and, and not just because he likes to eat, it's just he needed, he has no money, and that's what he lives on. He told me it's the places where he shot marmots, I'm like, and there's marmots there. Wow, thank you, Jerry. He also told us some information that wasn't true. Uh, but, and so we went out and we looked. It's very hard to find marmots. I brought my dog one year because if a marmot sees a dog or a fox or a coyote communicating, they chirp really loud. Mm -hmm. Turned out she wasn't any, really much help at all. <laughs> <laughs> we had to carry her a lot, uh, carry her up these mountains. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a wonderful dog, but worthless. And, uh, it's very hard to see marmots in there. If they don't, if they don't call, and they just kind of stick their head out, it's going to be awful hard to see them. Um, but fortunately. Uh, they do call occasionally, and they have scats, which you can find. Um, and for example, can you see the marmot in this picture? Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah but I would not have seen this marmot if I had it hadn't called. It called, and I didn't. It, they call. It's a high pitch call. It bounces off everything. So you just where did it come from? Uh, and fortunately, I saw it. Um, how about here? Riley, this is the one marmot Riley elicited a call. Thank goodness. It's getting dark. While you're looking for it, notice the vegetation, high elevation, that's lupin, you know, Rocky Mountain species, high elevation, sagebrush. Right there. Oh my god. This one left no scats that we could find. We would have been never found this one if we hadn't called. 
Uh, burrows hard to find, and when they're in rocks like that, this could be a, one of thousands of holes. Uh, they leave scats. And this is a uh, so if you've been in an area and they're common, or been there for any, even just one individual on average a year, over the years the scats build up, and you can find them. That's a good thing. Um, we uh, keep in mind nobody's done any of this. We, we weren't, uh, you know, any kind of detailed habitat analysis. We'll have to come. You have to find the places first. You have to document them. That's what we did. We had to just search around and find these places. We did, uh, took some temperature measurements. We took some temperature measurements of, of the burrows surrounding the rocks and air, just getting a general characterization. Uh, did photography, took GPS points, wrote down uh, notes, documented, you know, photo documented sites for the record. Uh, yeah, what did we find? Okay, we ended up, uh, I'm gonna show you here is there were 16 sites that were in Hall's records where we actually physically went back and went, or we were able to otherwise document yes or no, our marmots there. So there's 16 of those comparisons there, and some of these are kind of overlapping, but they're closer together. What did we find? The marmots are still there uh, in all but one site. Let's set down here. So that's kind of the basic, that's one result. They're still there. In general, they're still there. Uh, that site is an exception. Um, eight sites I never gotten to yet. Uh, either maybe I never will. Some of them are on private land, ones on military land, and others I just uh, haven't gotten to yet. I'm not sure about the private land status. You don't want to go roaming around on ranchers' land but unwittingly. Uh, there were eight other sites where Hall didn't find any marmots, and we found that they still we couldn't find any marmots either. But then there were interestingly five other sites where we found marmots places where Hall went, surveyed, and by the way, when he collected, that means shooting and trapping. Back then, you, that's what they, they did. Uh, we found marmots, and I think in this case here, these are marmots that colonized later on. They weren't there. He was a very astute observer. He would have recorded them if he saw them. Maybe they recolonized. Maybe they colonized since then. I want to tell you about four sites that illustrate some of the general patterns we're finding here. Reno, White Pine, Eastgate, and Hot Creek. Reno, marmots in Reno, yeah, marmots in Reno. Uh, this record here, this is a note from 1935. This kid, 15-year-old uh, boy, told E.R. Hall about shooting marmots at this location, and I was able to look at the example of the field notes. He didn't have that long information usually, so uh, I was I had to deduce where, for example, Mona swimming hole was, but I figured it out uh, historic, from the historical records, newspapers. Uh, I was able to figure out what, where that was. I actually found the, sort of the monument where the hot spring uh, swimming pool used to be. And I was able to deduce where that location was where he used to shoot marmots. And that location happens to be the Lake Ridge Golf Course. There's a Mona a Lane there. This place. So you, usually suburbanization, you have suburbs, you think of it wiping out habitat. Yep, it's gone. In this case, there are many marmots uh, on the golf course. And unlike much of suburban, the suburban sprawl, which is pretty substantial in Reno, like a Cabela's went in and they just trapped out, shot the marmots that were there. Uh, the golf course, I think they basically threw their hands up there and said, okay, you win, marmots. In fact, we're, we are the marmot golf course. If you come to our <laughs> golf course, that's just part of the hazards there. They're part of our, I bet they directed a total blowout, so you know, uh, piece there. That's it, yeah, we're, we're, we're the Marmot Golf Course, very nice golf course. Uh, so that's, that's pretty interesting. What I like about this story is, doesn't it seem like Reno kind of just grew around? Because you know, 1935, Reno was a small city. It hadn't extended out to this point yet. It just seems like the tentacles of Reno just spread around the Marmots and they're still there. Or maybe they got wiped out and moved in to the nice green golf course, I don't know. Are, is this a high elevation or lower elevation? Marmots? Yeah, so, thanks, thanks, yeah. So, uh, it's at the base of the mountains. Okay. Um, and there's some sagebrush there. So it's not bad, but the habitat isn't montane. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, I find kind of, <laughs> it just kind of revolts my sense of what marmot habitat is. But that's just the way, that's just reality there. The White Pine Range, uh, this record here, I was able to find the exact rock pile. This was also, this is 1933, where he shot two marmots. This rock pile right here, I figured it out. And uh, as marmots turned out to be very hard to find in that mountain range, I looked for years actually and couldn't find them. 
Uh, can't find them in this ghost town of my, this mining town at all, anywhere near there, despite the presence of pretty good habitat. I found a couple of jaw bones in this rock pile, but look how, if, you, if marmots had been there, the scats would have fallen down and been easily found. They're just not there, not even old scats. So, two jaw bones, who knows? I, I think they really are gone from the town site. However, we, uh, thanks, to, thanks to my uh, wonderful undergraduates, we found, in 2014, we found uh, marmots at three locations, very hard to find, including this one. This is a mine, old mine there. There's the tailings coming out of it. I don't know if there was another shaft here or this is kind of a processing place, but we found marmots right down there. Here are three of them. One, two, these are juveniles. One back there. After I took this picture about 10 minutes later, mom picked each one up by the scruff and carried them away. Got them away from us. So we, we disturbed that site, unfortunately. But they live uh, down in the base of this uh, rock rubble with mine tailings, burrow temperature is about 49 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty, kind of indicates there could be some ice under there. Uh, sun exposed rock was about 86, and the ambient temperature, a very typical 73, usually doesn't get above 80, uh, at about 8,000 feet there. Uh, so here we have marmots living in a mine tailing. Uh, and I think that's pretty interesting. Then there's this place. This is Eastgate. Uh, the mountain ranges around there's marmots in, but this is out mainly in the kind of in the valleys. It's just a just a kind of a pathetic, nice mainly abandoned ranch. There's an irrigated field. It's not very well well irrigated. There's some sad looking horses out there. Uh, it's always been uncertain about who owns it. I have partial permission to go on it, put it that way. Uh, but there's this record here of marmot killed on that road in 1938, picked up, and then Terry Jones told me uh, that he. Uh, and others told me that, that they have shot marmots there and ate them. And so apparently there's a sustainable population there. Uh, they live, as if it, I just say this habitat, you would never find them, almost never find marmots at this elevation. And they're not really above here at all. I've looked all around, they're just here at this spot. Uh, there's no marmot habitat there that qualifies as marmot habitat to me. But they live around these cattle holding pens, this overgrade pasture, and then Railroad, they live in railroad ties. Not just any railroad ties, a stack of railroad ties. A stack of, I think I counted 2,500 railroad ties there. And there's the marmot there. And there are thousands of marmot scats in the rock. And this, so they've lived here for who knows how long, however long that those ties have been there, probably. Railroad ties? Uh, you know, sun exposed ties, you know, what would it be walking out with its feet about 102 that day I was there, I mean, temperature about 88, deep spaces, couldn't find any cool spaces, but I couldn't get way down in there, there might be burrows down there. That was <coughs> strange. Now finally, the last site uh, in 1933, I'm going to read this note here. A couple of Native Americans uh, <coughs> pointed him to the marmots being in this location. We visited the Page Ranch in Hot Creek Canyon, six miles west of Hot Creek, 6,100 feet in High County, Nevada, and were shown the carcasses of eight of 23 woodchucks, he calls them woodchucks, but they're marmots, trapped during the last uh, first, the last few months by Marl A. Page. Claude Pay A. Page and Marl A. Page indicated their willingness, indicated, I found out later, these are brothers and they're deaf mutes, they were given this land by the state of Nevada, they grew up in a ward, and said, you know, basically that's what they did, hey, see if you can make a living out there. Indicated their willingness to save the skins with the skulls, because he wants them to the museum specimens, of adults caught the next spring. They believe the woodchucks had gone into hibernation at the time of our visit. The woodchucks here lived in a hill of broken rock, at the base of which a crevice emitting cold air was found. Indeed, the air from the crevice was so cold as to freeze water to trickle down into icicles, or at least preserve these icicles, which could be seen in the back of the crevice. A recent cloudburst or heavy rain had occurred in the carcasses of most of the 23 woodchucks trapped now could not be found. I think they probably just lied about the carcasses. Finally. It occurred to me that the cold air emerging from the base of this rock pile, and perhaps filtering through it in other places, might be a factor in making this place livable for the marmots. So he indicated that he didn't really think this was a good habitat at all, that the cold air is what allowed the marmots to live there. Well, so I, I've seen this note before, and I was wondering, well, is this, I hadn't been there before until 2013, and I'm thinking, is this, what, what to make of this? So we went to this Page Ranch, 
and it's miles of area. So where do you search? We searched and searched, about to give up, and I saw this feature down here. I thought, oh, that's odd. Plus, it's like a, like a mine tailing, which is not like a mine shaft. And we found this feature here. To this day, this is the most exciting find I've ever found in all my years of research. Walked up here on a hot day in June. I was hit by a blast of cold air coming out of the base on this rock. This is like a walk-in refrigerator. Riley immediately ran in and laid down. <laughs> I, I'd be all like, oh my goodness. And then about five minutes later, we all got out. That's how it goes. Ice cream, headache, cold. Wow. You can't stay in there. This is looking out. You got somewhat, there's some springs in there, some wet valleys, but low elevation. Uh, the vegetation's not really what you'd really find in marmots, but the, a lot of good rock. The, no, we didn't find any visible ice. But the rock temperature was almost right at freezing back there. And the temperatures of the crevices going up, up slope, uh, 33 to 70, but we were getting 45 degree air coming out of the tailus up uh, 30 meters up higher. So that exposed rock, 82 to 92. The rocks themselves were relatively cool. The surfaces, even though they're in direct sun because of this cool air, and the ambient temperature was about 68 to 83. So the question to know is, did I, the icy talus feature really, was that the key to marmot persistence in the hot creek? And is it a fat, the answer to that is an emphatic no. There was no, there was no scats in this main crevice here or hardly anywhere else in the, there's no evidence that the marmots congregate there at all. They haven't really survived. There is evidence of Native Americans there. So I'm trying to get a, uh, there's charcoal, and I was trying to get a, uh, paleontologist or archaeologist to excavate this site. As you know, Native Americans is in a great place to store meat in a desert environment. Um, and the locals over the years have done that. Uh, they built this, they built a, a wooden structure a year, many years ago and put a canvas over it in kind of an air-conditioned building, practically. No sign of marmots in the main crevice or most of the tails, but they were pretty common up valley and down valley, so they don't congregate around this at all. It probably is just, it's not even haunting you, which surprises me. You think a, be a place the marmots to be out foraging and kind of go back in and shed their body heat. But they're just they're up at that cal up at canyon, down cal canyon, they're everywhere. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we found strong persistence of marmots many decades after Hall, unlike pika populations where many of them have been found to go extinct over that same period. Uh, a lot of these were at low elevation, were places with no habitat, really that I would call no montane habitat. To me, this suggests tolerance, the species is tolerant to, to recent warming. Um, maybe local populations will be resistant. Um, and I think this is kind of a reminder that regional distributions on a map, that you see in a map, they reflect local conditions. And sometimes the local conditions scale over large areas and sometimes they don't. And you can't understand marmot distributions at a regional level. I'm convinced that you have to understand local conditions. Uh, the importance of Thermal features, the micro uh, environments, and unique landscape features. Um, they might allow persistence in places that you wouldn't expect. And maybe even some positive effects of human land use, like golf courses and mine tailings. So uh, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, you all for your attention, and uh, thank uh, a lot of people who have helped me over the years, the owners of the uh, Hot Creek Ranch there, who we became friends, I've become really good friends with now. They're, they're eager to have me study there that uh, they'd love to have anthropologists uh, excavate that site uh, and then BLM and uh, Park Service, National Forest Service and uh, any questions or comments? Yeah. Well one thing I thought of right away is you got to get those dogs that they're using now to find rare and difficult to locate species and basically they train them on the scent, and then they, they ferret them out. Yeah. So even for amphibians or other, other things, you need like a couple of dogs. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of dogs? A particular well, they're dogs. Dogs, they're various species. So I mean, they just train? Use, they maybe use them to find killer whale scat. Yeah. Uh, Landmines and things like that, too. Well, well, yeah, but they, 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 all, all sorts of things. Drugs. And the killer whale, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's the so Karen, it's faculty student canine collaborative. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> It would actually be very helpful if I actually have a dog, not an official one I don't have to carry. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a pause? Get, is that a shot? Bag ball or a pause, pause every night. <laughs>
Is, is that a Sheltie? Yeah. Yeah, they're not no, dog no. dogs. <laughs> no, there's cacti and rattlesnakes out there, too. So, so you're saying, go ahead. As you go up, you're saying you think they go extinct and then a population, or are they literally moving up as you're saying the change? Well, pika populations, the archaeological data show like pikas were right down in this low elevation, right. and now they're not here, not there. You have to go up higher to find them. So it looks like over the years, you, know, you have a, a range of up a mountain of right. monotene species, and the lower elevation parts of it blink off. So that what you're left with is a shrinking uh, distribution to the top of the mountain. So it's not necessarily they're going extinct lower end, they're moving. Well, it, yeah, they're going, yeah, moving is sort of a distributional thing. Right. You know, one decade they're just gone, so presumably it went extinct in those lower populations. The individuals might not move. It could be a young one disperses. When they okay. disperse, they go tend to go up. Right. That's possible. Okay. And have you looked at aspect on this at all? No, but my big marmot habitat study is we are going to include aspect, rock type, hopefully talus if we can get those overlays. Right. Uh, everything we can get our hands on. I was thinking about, it, do you think it, there's something that could be about if there's a population that's well established and they have nice deep burrows, then yeah, the temperature rises, they, they're okay, right? Because they're established. But they, maybe that way they'll persist for quite a while because they're, they, they have that refugia already built. Do you think? Yeah, maybe what we're seeing is those are the remnants. They're, I mean, in a sense, it's circular. They're, they're, why they're there? Because they already had that feature. It's kind of proof that they do have the had, they do have the local refugia because they, otherwise they wouldn't be there. It's kind of circular. Yeah. But you also got to wonder though, if you were to go back ten thousand years and ask a you know a Clovis person, hey, yeah, by the way, I think these populations down here are going to go extinct. And the ones that actually did, right? They might say, no, 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 no way. You know, if you were, if you were to go back ten thousand years, you might be able to actually see this happening. So how do we know, you know, it could be that these populations like at Eastgate, maybe you go forward 50 years and they do go extinct. So maybe those are the last hope ones that are holding on. But maybe not. There's, I think there's, one of the things, the stories I'm going to try to hopefully probe and maybe tell is the idea that marmots might not be a montane species after all. What if they're actually a sort of mid-elevation species that extends its range, is able to extend its range up and down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about that too. I mean, what you're seeing is that strategy to utilize the habitat. And, and yeah, there's been, there's, you, if you go up in the mountains, you'll find lots of marmots. But there's also those other marmot populations, maybe less noticed, maybe not as abundant, but they've been there for just as long. And now those are going to be the dominant populations because that's the montane habitat that's going to be snuffed out. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And also, I think you should write a book. I mean, because this is really cool, the story, you know, following the historical yeah. record, and then some of these, these, these bizarre finds. Mm -hmm. I can retire and uh, you know yeah. retirement and still have problems. My sources are drying up. There's people are they're old. I mean, every year I go back. I'm, some of my rancher people I uh, you know go to visit. They're they're dying. So yeah. Bob, I mean, I don't. I, I'm gonna have a call in this year yet. I always dread the call because he's not in good health. He's a cool character. I mean, it's yeah. like you know, like desert solitaire. Yeah. Some of the interesting people at Abbey Ranch. I do plan to write a book. It's good. Yeah. That'd be good. So. Is it, is it common, um, sort of in ecology, this idea that humans build habitats but animals uh, take over? I mean, I'm thinking deer are doing really yeah. well around here because we've created the right environment yeah. for them. Yeah. So your story about the marmots, it's not surprising that they've done yeah. that? or yeah, Maybe not. Yeah, exactly. Irrigated fields. Where you wouldn't have had an area before, you might have a little stream only, but now you have an irrigated field. Um, you know, so it extends the habitat. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, alfalfa. Alpha. But that, that cold air feature, I'm still trying to figure it out. I have done all of the gone to the limit of my geological knowledge. I can't go any further on that. I need a geologist, I need a geomorphologist. Got one. Uh, yeah, that's what I need because <laughs> there's can't be, there's no rock glacier up there. It's not why, a, it's not why a, not? It's, it's just there, there are no there are no glaciers period at that latitude in Nevada that, that it's, it just can't there's no nothing about the landscape that would indicate glacial period. but but rock glaciers can be there for tens of thousands of years later and you don't know because from the surface they don't look like a rock glacier but internally there's still that ice 
and as long as they're protected like an insulation right. blanket, they could be there and they're in odd places all through the Great Basin Range. It, there has to be a, a tongue of ice in there, right. that's for sure. I just don't know if it qualifies. I mean, I've seen so many rock glaciers. One thing about rock glaciers in Colorado is they don't vent cold air like this one. I mean, you hear some cold air, but it's, this is wafting. Yeah. What it is, it's, I know what it is, it's overcooled in the winter. So you have relatively cold air, so it forms like a, it's like a stove pipe. Uh, and so what's happening is that, uh, and I figured, that, figured this out by reading some other literature from the Alps, that uh, the, the, the air underneath here in the winter is relatively warm. And so it, it, the relatively warm air in the ice cave rises up through the talus, kind of like a chimney, and pulls in cold yeah. valley air. Mm -hmm. And so you get a cave, should be, 50s, 40s, you're ready to insulate, right? This one's not. This one just takes in the ambient air in the winter. So during the winter, it's overcooled. That preserves the ice. And then during the summer, of course, you get convection and conduction of heat after that. But the ice mass is large enough that it's still there. Keep in mind, we just finished four or five years of drought in this area of Sivir. So I got to see it. This is during the drought. This is the end of the drought period, you know. And it's still there. So it's still there. Yeah. But, wow. so, but I think when that thing blinks off, when it does finally melt, if it does, that, I don't necessarily think it's going to affect the marmots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.